Hey friends, this episode of The Fellow on Call is not meant to be used for medical advice and is intended for educational purposes only. Patient information has been modified to ensure privacy. The views expressed in this episode do not necessarily reflect the views of our employers. Enjoy! Welcome to another episode of The Fellow on Call, the Hemong podcast. We're coming at you from Merlot University Medical Center. I'm Ronak. I'm Vivek. And I'm Dan. And in today's episode, we continue on our DLBCL journey, this time getting into the actual diagnostic workup and management, this time talking all about early stage DLBCL. Yeah, I'm really excited to get into this case where we really talk about early stage DLBCL and how it's really interesting that we've allowed for less therapy for these patients with really good outcomes. Always good to be de-escalating patients. Sometimes the impulse is to just give more and more and more, and it's always good to keep in mind like what we're really exposing patients to and what's actually necessary to affect the outcome we want. Yeah, and I think the story of DLPCL tells a great one about how you can do so much more with less. So why don't we go ahead and roll that show? Guys, I've been excited to tell you about a secret ingredient that I was reminded of this past weekend that really just adds a kick to a lot of the things that I feel like I want to be cooking in the near future. That adobo pepper sauce, I know it may sound very random, but my aunt, I went to go visit her out in Knoxville in Vivek's neck of the woods. She had made enchiladas and had mixed these adobo peppers in there. And I was just inspired to come back and incorporate that into my cooking. And I did that this week. And I just, I don't know, I feel like it brings out the flavor and food that I haven't had in a long time. I, it seems trivial, but I'm excited. Yeah, you should be. I, I love incorporating pepper every now and then. Are these like the little chilies packed in adobo? Yep, yeah, yep, that's yeah. exactly right. A little smoked, smoked jalapenos. That smoky it. flavor really brings out the flavors and, and all the ingredients overall. And I put that stuff in guacamole. It really makes it really good. It's like that nice, smoky, a little bit of spice to guacamole. The adobe pepper's really good. Ooh, Saison seasoning, changer. also very underrated. That's some good stuff too. Wow, guys, I'm taking notes about this and other things. So this is awesome. I'm excited to continue on our conversation this week all about DLBCL and this time moving the pendulum a little bit towards actually talking about some of the management approaches to this disease. And, you know, last week, I think we did a really, really nice job of breaking down the fundamentals of the biology and, and laying out a framework for how we approach this disease. And I'm excited to get into that next step. Vivek, do you want to kick us off with the case for this week? Yeah, I've got a good case for you guys. So we have a 55-year-old male who presents with an enlarging chin mass over the past two months. He reports mild fatigue and otherwise feels well. His exam is notable for a firm chin mass that is mildly tender to palpation without drainage, and otherwise his exam is unremarkable. His primary care ordered labs including a CBC, CMP, and thyroid function panel, which were all unremarkable. His social history is notable for a one-pack-per-day smoking history. He was sent to ENT then for further evaluation by his primary care provider. Two weeks later, he was seen by ENT, and he had an FNA of the chin mass, a biopsy. That FNA showed large atypical lymphocytes by morphology and flow cytometry with a CD5-negative, CD10-positive, CD20-positive, kappa-restricted, monotypic B-cell population with increased forward scatter. So before we get more into the staging and treatment, let's start with breaking down the rationale for obtaining an FNA and how do you interpret the flow cytometry results for this patient. It's a really good recap for what we talked about last week. Yeah, so remember, when we have a broad differential that we're starting with, it's not wrong to start with that FNA. You know, we always talk about how, oh, excisional biopsy for lymphoma. But in this case, We didn't really know what we were dealing with when we have a patient presenting with a chin mass. So I agree with starting with an FNA here. It's something you can get quickly and get your workup underway. In this case, we did have concern for lymphoma. Just It was on the differential, so I'm glad they sent that flow cytometry. And as we discussed last week, that CD10 positivity indicates that this is likely a tumor of germinal center origin. And it lets us formulate an early differential diagnosis. It sort of starts to pare down what we're thinking about. This differential, of course, is not perfect, but it can help in more complicated cases. So always think of the following when you see that CD10 positivity indicating germinal center origin. Follicular lymphoma, DLBCL, and Burkitt lymphoma. 
The last thing to remember is that that increased forward scatter on flow cytometry tells us that the cells are large in size. In lymphoma, we generally think of larger cells as being more aggressive. This isn't always true, of course, as Burkitt lymphoma characteristically has a more medium-sized cell, and that's a very aggressive form of lymphoma, but as a broad rule of thumb, that's something to keep in mind. In the end, we ultimately will need more tissue to make a diagnosis now that we see that this is likely a lymphoma. A few atypical cells is unfortunately not diagnostic, and we really need to see that architecture of the lymph node, see if there's effacement of that normal architecture to secure what subtype of lymphoma we're dealing with. It's really important to remember that the FNA isn't a useless test and, you know, really a good refresher on the flow cytometry basics. So our patient had a planned ultrasound-guided core biopsy of the chin mass after we were concerned for this lymphoma. And remember, we discussed last week that a PET CT scan and LDH are critically important for prognostication and staging, so those are ordered as well. The PET scan showed a 3-centimeter intensely avid chin mass and no other sites of disease. This was noted to be a Doville 5. The LDH was mildly elevated at 260, which is above the upper limit of normal at our institution. A core biopsy was consistent with DLBCL, GCB subtype by cell of origin, and the fish was notable for additional copies of MYC and otherwise unremarkable. IHC did not have overexpression of MYC or BCL2. So first thing, how are we going to interpret the PET-CT and how would we stage this patient? So if you guys remember to last week, we talked a little bit about the Lugano criteria and remember that that was named after a meeting that was held in Lugano, Switzerland in 2011, where they came up with these different criteria. And prior to that, we were using the Ann Arbor staging, which was developed in the CT era in Ann Arbor, Michigan. So the thing here is that we want to be able to classify DLBCL as either early stage or advanced stage, and this will significantly impact our treatment paradigm. So it's so important to establish this up front. So remember, early stage disease is single nodal disease, single site of extra nodal involvement, or lymph nodes confined to the same side of the diaphragm. And there are some nuances of this that I want to go into in just a little bit. So number one, the nodal groups are clearly defined, and we'll have a link of this in our show notes. Patients with extra nodal disease that isn't contiguous with nodal involvement are not actually early stage. We would classify these as advanced stage. Another way to think about this is that the extra nodal disease must be encompassed in the same radiation field as the nodal disease to be considered early stage. So for example, if this patient had his chin mass and also happened to have a hilar lymph node, then that would actually be stage 4 disease. It wouldn't be classified as early stage given the distance between the chin and the hilar lymph node. And we denote extra nodal disease by the letter E in staging if it is related to early stage disease. And so this includes involvement of the marrow, skin, bones, or other solid organs, but not the spleen, which is considered a nodal structure. An important distinction is the concept of bulky disease. And you will hear this term from time to time. People describe patients having bulky disease. And the reason for this is that bulky disease is treated similar to those patients with more advanced disease. So in DLBCL, there are varying definitions of what is classified as bulky, but think about more than... 10 centimeters as being bulky, although you may see this metric be seven and a half because of the inclusion criteria and a few key trials that we'll discuss in just a little bit. Advanced disease in converse is classified as either stage three disease, which is involvement of nodes above and below the diaphragm. And remember, the spleen is considered a lymph node. Bone marrow is considered extranodal and would upstage a patient to stage four. And then stage four, then, is diffuse involvement of one or more extranodal tissues. The key is that all the sites of lymphoma can't be encompassed in one radiation field. And this is very similar to when we had previously discussed small cell lung cancer. Remember, there was limited and extensive stage based on that same idea. So always still remind your patients that even with stage four disease and lymphoma, we can still approach this disease with curative intent, which is awesome. For this patient, he fortunately has early stage disease with a single site of extranodal involvement and no evidence of bulky disease. This would be denoted as stage 1E, with the E meaning extranodal involvement. Okay, that makes sense. So when we're here in early stage disease, we should be thinking of patients who have a single site of involvement or nodes on the same side of the diaphragm 
and who don't have bulky tumors. And bulk in this case really is a term of art. That means sort of tumors greater than somewhere around seven and a half, 10 centimeters. And so those are your early stage patients. And when we see that patient population, they'll have different treatment options from those who have bulky or advanced stage disease. But before we get into those treatments, how do you interpret that Dogal score that you mentioned? And what about the rest of the biopsy report? Yeah, I think this is really good to know. So the key thing that you're realizing about lymphoma is we had Ann Arbor staging because the group met in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Then we had the Lugano modification because they met in Lugano, Switzerland. Well, guess what? We have the Deauville score because they met in Deauville, France. So this was really a group of experts that met with the primary goal of defining PET criteria to determine escalation and de-escalation therapy, particularly for Hodgkin lymphoma. Because, you know, we would have these patients who have residual masses on CT imaging, and the question was, do you still need to do things like radiation therapy? Could you potentially de-escalate therapy? So that group in Deauville met for that reason. And they developed a score from one to five that compares the uptake of the tissue of interest to the mediastinal blood pool and the liver. And what this score is also called is the five-point scale. So you'll see this as the Deauville score, one to five, or the five-point scale score. So they're really, truly interchangeable, all from this Deauville, France meeting. When thinking about initial staging, the score really doesn't matter, but generally a score of four or higher is considered active lymphoma. So when we think about response criteria, a score of three or less means that this is an inactive lymphoma that we're in remission. So Deauville three or less, or in other words, five-point scale score of three or less means there's no longer active lymphoma, and this correlates to equal or less than FDG uptake of the liver, because remember, you're comparing to the mediastinal blood pool and the liver. One thing that always confused me for a very, very long time is how do I assess for bone marrow avidity? What exactly does that mean? So in a patient who hasn't had recent chemotherapy or recent GCSF use, in which case in those patients you would expect the marrow to be active during recovery, the whole point of this criteria and when this group met, we basically decided that for patients with bone marrow avidity, there's not really a reason to also do a bone marrow biopsy in that patient, that the bone marrow biopsy is not required for staging. The reason for that is early stage patients will rarely, if ever, have bone marrow involvement. So there's no real reason to doing that unless you may have had diffuse marrow uptake on the PET scan. If we have an advanced stage patient, so nodes above and below the diaphragm or extranodal involvement that's relatively diffuse or bulky extranodal involvement. Then when we think about those patients and they had marrow avidity, again, there's no real role in getting that bone marrow biopsy. We would just assume the bone marrow is involved because it's not going to change our management. Ultimately, that wouldn't change our management. So you can omit the bone marrow biopsy by using PET scan avidity as a surrogate for bone marrow involvement of their lymphoma. The last thing on that PATH report, as we discussed last week, is that the FISH is really important to identify patients who have high-grade B-cell lymphoma. That was what you'll commonly hear as double-hit or triple-hit lymphoma that really is classified as high-grade B-cell lymphoma. And this requires a rearrangement in MYC and BCL2 or BCL6. Additional copies is not a rearrangement and does have a minor prognostic role, but not the same as a fish rearrangement. And just remember that MYC is like the eight ball and pool, very, very important, and it's located on chromosome eight. So I always associate MYC with the eight ball. Located on chromosome eight, you're looking for that rearrangement in MYC and BCL2 or BCL6. And one thing I did want to mention here, I love radiology, so I just wanted to bring this up. These PET scores and this Deauville score, it can be a little bit tricky to assign, especially when we get into areas that have just a very high baseline amount of FDG uptake. So, for example, you'll see the Waldeyer's ring mentioned as a nodal group. And if you remember from anatomy back back in the day, this is the uh, sort of the tonsils, the nasopharynx and oropharynx, that sort of ring of lymphoid tissue back there. And these are areas that have high baseline uptake of FDG contrast of that fluorodeoxyglucose. And so in these areas, you may see a greater uptake than the liver, which typically would be like a double four by that scale or higher. And it may not mean that lymphoma is present there. And 
The same is typically true for bone marrow, especially if we're stimulating that marrow with something like GCSF or or recent recovery from chemotherapy. For these cases, if other areas of initial FDG uptake have gone to a score or three or less, then we don't necessarily consider that lack of response. We'll st- we can still assume that that patient is in CR. Got it. So this has clarified a lot for me. And, you know, we always throw around these terms and breaking down what these terms mean is so critical to understanding the disease. And as we've been saying, also important to understanding how we approach these patients. So I want to round out this discussion. And Vivek, based on what you told us, I'll remind our listeners that last week I talked all about the apples mnemonic, which helps us to risk stratify our patients. And so for him, his age is less than 60. It sounds like his performance status is less than a two, if I'm not mistaken from what you said. LDH is elevated. He only has one extranodal site of disease, not two or more. And his stage is not three or four based on the PET scan. And so this gives him an IPI score of one for the LDH. So overall, favorable prognosis. So in this patient with early stage large B-cell lymphoma with an IPI score of one, how would you approach this gentleman's case? So I'm going to go through a brief historical perspective, and next week we'll also get more into the history of lymphoma because it's really fascinating how this happened. So for decades, starting in the 1970s, the historical standard of care for diffuse large B-cell lymphoma was CHOP chemotherapy. This includes four drugs, cyclophosphamide, doxorubicin, previously called hydroxydonorubicin, hence the H, vincristine, also known as oncovin, hence the O, and prednisone, so for CHOP. So really, until 2002, CHOP was a standard of care, and in 2002, there was a trial that showed an overall survival benefit of RCHOP versus CHOP, where we added that rituximab anti-CD20 antibody. And in the early era, CHOP and RCHOP were given for eight cycles, until we eventually realized that six cycles were sufficient. But even with this, many researchers knew that we could probably get away with less combination chemotherapy for early stage disease. These patients had really good prognosis, and it seemed like six or eight cycles was probably too much. There were a couple of prospective studies done in the 80s that suggested three cycles of CHOP followed by radiation therapy had similar outcomes to eight cycles of RCHOP for early stage DLBCL. And this really became the conceptual framework for how we treat these patients today. So the first pivotal randomized trial in early stage DLBCL was done by the SWOG Cooperative Group. This was called S8736, published in 1998 in the New England Journal of Medicine. We're going to link it to our show notes. But ultimately, this randomized patient's that had early stage disease without bulky involvement, remember that's that greater than about 7.5 to 10 centimeters, depending on which trial you looked at, and patients either got 8 cycles of CHOP or 3 cycles of CHOP followed by involved field radiotherapy, IFRT, in other words, radiation therapy to the site of disease. And there was about a 10% improvement in overall survival at 82% from 72% with CHOP times three cycles followed by radiation. So that's pretty huge, right? We gave them five less cycles of chemotherapy and consolidated them with relatively lower doses of radiation. Interestingly, in longer-term follow-up that was published in 2016, so median follow-up of about 18 years, there was really no difference in overall survival or progression-free survival, so there was this notable 10% difference early on, but with long-term follow-up, there was really no difference overall. Nonetheless, you're sparing patients additional cycles of chemotherapy, even though you're adding this radiation, so that really became an idea for a standard of care. And the SWOG group then kind of replicated that idea with RCHOP times three followed by radiation. It was a phase two trial that we're going to link to our show notes. And again, this showed an improved PFS and OS compared to historical standards, really. And not a perfect analysis, but it also seemed better than CHOP times three followed by radiation. So that's how we got to one of the options, which is RCHOP for three cycles followed by radiation therapy. Well, I think that makes a lot of sense. So Basically, what you're saying is that we don't need to do as many cycles of RCHOP for early stage disease, and we can consolidate all the gains that we make with less treatment with radiation, given that these tumors are very radiosensitive. So there are, of course, concerns with using radiation, particularly in this patient with his mass being on his chin. So are there any non-radiation approaches for early stage patients that you would recommend? Yeah, that's a really great question. And 
Another option for these patients, we talked about RCHOP times three followed by radiation therapy, is RCHOP times four cycles. And so we can prevent the use of radiation therapy. So how do we get to this approach? Well, this requires an interim PET CT after three cycles of therapy. And this is one of the reasons why that five point scale score is so important. You need a five point scale score of three or less after three cycles of therapy in order to omit radiation and just do one extra cycle of RCHOP. So this was actually found to work in a kind of a quirky phase two single arm trial that evaluated a new novel drug that we don't use at all in, anymore and it's actually off the market. It was a Y90 CD20 antibody. doesn't really matter what that was. But basically in that study, patients got three cycles of RCHOP. They got a PET scan. If they were PET negative, they just got an additional cycle of RCHOP and that's it. If they were PET positive, they got radiation plus this Y90 anti-CD20 antibody treatment. And really what we found was the five-year overall survival rate for those who got three of RCHOP, had an interim PET with a CR, and then an additional cycle, so four total cycles of RCHOP, five-year overall survival was 91%. And this is really concordant with what was observed with three cycles of RCHOP followed by radiation, that SWOG trial that we talked about, again, single arm, but that was very, very similar, at least in survival-wise. So we said, that seems very reasonable, and we can spare radiation to some of these patients. The last trial we need to discuss about this for early stage patients is a phase three non-inferiority randomized trial called the FLYER study. And here we looked at the most favorable state patients. So these were early stage, non-bulky in this study defined by seven and a half centimeters, so less than seven and a half centimeters, and an IPI score of zero. And what they did was they randomized patients to RCHOP times four, followed by two cycles of single agent rituximab versus RCHOP for six cycles. No difference in PFS or OS with the long-term OS of about 98%. So technically, this is another option. RCHOP for four cycles, doesn't matter what the interim PET is, with two cycles of rituximab maintenance. We often don't do this because we get an interim PET. And if you had a positive interim PET, then I would want to go for a radiation approach in that case rather than doing this thing where I'm giving another cycle of RCHOP and two cycles of rituxan maintenance. So something that you don't see us use very often, what you'll see us do more often is RCHOP times three, get the interim PET. If PET negative, just one additional cycle of RCHOP. If PET positive, then consider doing radiation or completing six cycles of RCHOP. Either of those are reasonable. Okay, so we talked about a lot of important concepts for lymphoma in this episode, but really what it boils down to, your first branch point is are you dealing with early stage without bulky disease, or are you dealing with advanced stage, including those who are stage two that have bulky disease, defined as that greater than seven and a half, ten 10 centimeter size. In our case, our patient has early stage disease, and we opted for RCHOP times four cycles rather than the RCHOP times three followed by radiation therapy. And on our interim PET, after three cycles of therapy, we showed that Doval scale score was two. And remember, it's a five-point scale. So it's an improvement. He was previously a five, he's now, he's now Doval two. He was given one additional cycle of RCHOP for that definitive treatment to complete that treatment. Uh, I do have one last question for you guys, though. If he had a rearrangement on fish in MYC and BCL2, making him more like a high-grade double-hit lymphoma, would we still consider RCHOP times three followed by IFRT versus RCHOP times four, you know, based on basically his preference? Or is there a more intensive chemotherapy regimen we'd have to recommend at that point? It's funny that you asked this, Dan, because I had this ex exact discussion with Vivek just a couple weeks ago about a patient I had in my clinic. And overall, what I learned was that we have very limited data in this space, but there is one good retrospective study that showed us that there really is no difference in outcomes when using the standard approaches versus an intensive regimen like dose-adjusted REPOC, which we'll talk about at a later time. But as that name suggests, certainly more drugs in this regimen. So there was no benefit to giving more, more treatment for these early stage patients. What I learned from this discussion is that I wouldn't escalate therapy solely based on the cytogenetics unless the patient had a relatively high burden of disease, like a large mediastinal mass or really bulky adenopathy in the early stage setting. And, you know, I, I think this sounds like an area that's that's ripe for additional study. So uh, always kind of exciting when you when you find those spaces in, in medicine. But let's change the case a little bit. I You know, our guy was 55 years old. Let's say he was 83 instead. What's your approach for the older patient with early stage DLBCL? 
I think this is a great question, and and I know we're talking about it in the early stage setting, but everything I'm going to say here also applies to the advanced stage for these older patients. There's a really good review article published in Blood just a couple of years ago. I think it may have been a year or two ago where we talk about our modern approaches to this treatment strategy. One of the most important things is to determine the frailty of the patient. And when we think elderly, we're generally thinking patients greater than the age of 80. And a frailty assessment is very, very important. Most of these patients cannot tolerate R-CHOP, and we go with something called R-mini-CHOP. That cyclophosphamide is normally 750 milligrams per meter squared. We're reducing that to 400 milligrams per meter squared. The doxorubicin is normally 50 milligrams per meter squared. We're reducing that to 25 milligrams per meter squared, and we're capping the vincristine dose at one milligram, so it's just a lot less intensive chemotherapy, and we still get pretty good outcomes, particularly for these older patients who may die of something else that isn't even even related to the lymphoma. So really, I would reserve RCHOP with GCF support for older patients who are less than 80 in general. If they couldn't tolerate an anthracycline, so if I couldn't give them something like R-mini-CHOP if they're greater than the age of 80, then you can think about replacing that anthracycline with a toposide. So thinking about something like an R-mini-CEOP. So basically, you're just swapping out doxorubicin for etoposide. And our gemox is another very reasonable option. It's just a palliative option for some of these patients. And the other really important thing here is that for these older patients, their performance status can decline very rapidly with lymphoma, and a pre-phase treatment can be extremely helpful in determining what the actual fitness of the patient is. This has been done in several studies. Way early on, the German groups, the German lymphoma groups, did studies on pre-phase where they gave patients one milligram of vincristine followed by seven days of high-dose prednisone, and they found that many of the patients actually recovered performance status after about about four to five days, very quickly, these patients recover their performance status. What we realize is we probably don't need that vincristine. Doing prednisone 100 milligrams daily for five to seven days prior to starting therapy can dampen down the underlying cytokine storm that happens in patients with lymphoma, and it can have them tolerate RCHOP therapy better, and there's less rates of treatment-related mortality. So it's a very reasonable thing to do to improve a patient's performance status, and it's another good idea of thinking as a palliative measure in some patients if you if you get to that point for some of these older patients. And never forget that radiation therapy is very reasonable for older patients while sparing them chemotherapy as a palliative measure. So radiation therapy is your friend in lymphoma for some of these patients. Well, that was awesome. Um, I feel like we have a really good framework for approaching our patients with early stage disease, but big highlights and big takeaways from this, though, is really going to be based on what our initial workup is. And that also definitely includes the use of the PET scan, which Vivek said last week can upstage somebody 30% of the time. So critical to get as soon as we have a suspicion of lymphoma, but that will also help us define, you know, all the other factors that we're going to incorporate into our decision-making, extent of disease, bulkiness of disease, et cetera. Um, And putting all that together, then we have several options as we've outlined today in regards to how we approach these patients. And so hopefully listeners, you have a good framework about how to approach your next patient with DLBCL. In the next episode, we will build on this and talk about DLBCL more in the advanced setting, but this is certainly a great discussion to start with. So any final thoughts from you guys? Just want to apologize to all the listeners for the amount of lymphoma I talk about. This is this is my jam. Dan Dan, Jam is Jan and Ronak are they love their classical hematology. Lymphoma is my jam. You guys can't see it, but Vivek is smiling the entire time. It's almost a little bit creepy. And we're glad to have that content expertise available to us here on the Fellow On Call. All right, guys. Well, until next time, we'll see you all later. See you later. See you later.